Hi, everybody. We're the Skeleton Crew, and today we are recording a very special episode because tonight it is my birthday. And to celebrate my birthday, there is no animal we'd rather feature than the only representative of a group of animals I did a tremendous amount of my doctoral dissertation work on, which is Overactor. Um, so some of you who know my work may know this, some of you may not. I focused a lot on Oviraptor source for my PhD, and I worked on a very long and detailed description of an Oviraptor sword dinosaur called Citipati. That paper is not published yet, although I just had a meeting with um, the incredibly talented artist, Mick Ellison, who we're working with for it. Uh, he's done all of the figure work for it, and it's going to be a truly incredible paper, and we're approaching the end of figure generation. So that paper will be out quite soon, and I look forward to sharing it with all of you. This is not Citipati. This is Oviraptor. It's the sure only Oviraptorosaur in this game, and so we're going to talk about everything that is relevant about Oviraptorosaurs that you might want to know here, unless we eventually make another video about them at some point, which, knowing us, we probably will. Before we talk we'll about Oviraptorosaurs... we never talk about Oviraptorosaurs ever again. No, never again. Um, but before we talk about them, a couple of things. One, you should like this video. Two, you should comment on this video. Three, you should subscribe to our channel. Four, if you can, you should support us on Patreon. We've done the YouTuber things we have to say now. Thank you all for your support. Now, I'm Dr. James Napoli. I am a postdoctoral researcher at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and North Carolina State University. My name is Scott Johnston. I am the vertebrate paleontology fossil preparator and technician at Harvard University's Museum of Comparative Zoology. Hi, Scott. I'm Alex Rubenstahl, a PhD candidate at this year Yale University. And I'm Dalton Meyer, also a PhD candidate at this year Yale University. And together, we're the skeleton crew. We're most of the skeleton crew. We're most of the skeleton crew. Amelia is a fake friend and didn't come to my birthday party. Um, so we're recording <laughs> without her. Amelia um, is, on the ins is, is in the inside place now. She'll come back soon. She got abducted by Montanans. Yeah. Yes. No, Amelia uh, is going to give a public talk at an event, and so she's unfortunately the away from... At the Dino Shindig. We can at the Dino Shindig. Yeah, no, I yeah. guess we can. Right, yeah. Yeah, she's giving a talk at the <laughs> Dino Shindig. Um, she's not within range of reliable Wi-Fi, and she's on a time difference. So she wasn't able to record with us tonight. Um, I don't hold it against her for missing my birthday. Um, I did actually get to have dinner with her last night because I was visiting New York, uh, visiting the collections of the American Museum of Natural History. So um, all is forgiven, even if she misses the Overaptor episode. Um, but anyway, Sad. let's get right into it. I don't want to belabor this whole introduction thing anymore. Let's talk about Overaptor. Dalton, no more belaboring indeed. the point. Show, us, show me the baby. Certainly. Look out. Oh Here my god. Up. Here they come. Look at them all. Look at all those chickens. <laughs> Good. They're, oh my god, they're really nice. They're precious. I love the, like, just increasing number of tiny feathered dinosaurs in this game. Like, these and Moros. Yeah. yeah. I love having them. They make me incredibly 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 happy yeah this was actually like i think a lot of people were very impressed that pyroraptor which the pyroraptor video will be out when this video is out right yes yeah. yeah okay so we you see folks we record things in a weird order sometimes and uh <laughs> even we can't keep track of when videos are going to come out Ooh. um but oh my so, god so they did, the bird. they did the bird we talked about the bird in our second video, um, which remarkably is still our highest viewed video on the entire channel. For now. For now. Somehow, um, yay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is actually Oviraptor's second appearance because we talked about it back a long time ago when we reviewed the Malta DLC. In fact, if I had to guess, a lot of you viewing the video right now probably found our channel through that video. Um, statistically. Yeah, statistically, a lot of you found us through that. That was a really lucky thing that happened. I still have no idea why the algorithm picked it up the way it did, but I'm not complaining. Um, yeah, so anyway, when this, like, when the Cretaceous prologue of Jurassic World Dominion released online, this was actually the thing I was most impressed by. 
Um, I think it was it was shot beautifully in silhouette, shown eating an egg, which was something we'll get into later. But something about the way they did the feathers on the tail and the way the light passed through the feathers and the way they moved mm-hmm. felt just incredibly real to me. There's well, a glaring did, issue with the feathering, but... Did you see um, there was some animation reference that uh, one of the animators posted on on Twitter a little bit after uh, the movie came out of the, that scene is... I don't want to, like disparage their work and say it's rotoscoping but it's it's very heavily based on um a video of a crow eating an egg so like a lot of the movements and stuff are just so like the movements and stuff really caught me Hmm. on that of just like wow they really nailed the birdie aspect it was like oh they used a bird right no but i just mean this the way they simulated the feathers right Mm because feathers are Mm -hmm. kind of i think the final frontier of of like fuzzy integument things that animators need to deal with right because there's been a lot of effort done into hair simulation mm-hmm. so while like we i don't think a lot of animation uh workflows or programs or simulators or whatever the right word is can properly model like the way that body hairs can erect and depress themselves and everything generally speaking hairy animals are now at a point where if they're rendered properly and like the resources are invested they can look pretty good Right, simulating hair has been a huge focus of the animation industry for a long time. Because um, we have it. Because we have it, right. Yeah. right. Scales have not gotten as much attention, and I think a lot of scaly animals still look very weird in close-up. Um, Prehistoric Planet is one of the first things that really doesn't seem to have that issue. Mm-hmm. Um, the Walking with Dinosaurs 3D movie actually does really well with the scales, because they developed a new system in which the scales are actually allowed to be individual like solid elements that are floating in a skin connective tissue matrix, which is how how those scales are. Like how scales are, right. So they, what you will find in close up a lot of the time for scaly things is that the scales stretch and deform because it is actually a scale texture that's painted onto the model for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. Um, The dragons in game of Thrones suffer from that very, very badly. Uh, in the couple of shots where like the the dragons are very close up to the actors with their heads like looming down, you can see a lot of deformation to the scales, mm-hmm. um, which it looks fine from a distance, but it does it breaks down close up. Um, feathers are really tough because feathers are are quite large and conspicuous, but are very complex in their movements. Every every feather on a bird's body, I think, has like four separate muscles controlling it. Jesus. At least maybe two. I I forget the exact anatomy, but they have erector and depressor muscles, and the feathers can rotate, and it, it's a very very complex system. So you can't quite simulate them in animation as like necessarily just a particle system the way you can do hair, especially if it's like human head hair that's just kind of flowing. Um, the feathers on the Overaptor in the Jurassic World Dominion prologue were the first time I was seeing CGI feathers, and I was completely convinced they were real. I, I was it, it was remarkable animation. Um, I wish Overaptor had featured more in the movie. But. Well, apparently it does in the. Uh extended edition which i have yet to watch i, I can't bring myself to watch that movie again <laughs> well, you well remember watch in, in, in the extended scene. edition it gets its head bitten off by a lystrosaurus yeah and then that's it pretty cool <laughs> runs around like a chicken with its head cut off for a couple seconds in a manner that is like almost shockingly more gory and gratuitous than you think of for jurassic world movies i mean that's probably why it was cut right i almost definitely yeah so fun and then a bunch of well, no, I'm not going to get into that. Yeah, I um, I actually did see Dominion twice because after we saw oh, it in theaters all together, yeah, yeah, my family wanted to watch it with me once it was on streaming, and I was like, okay, did you fight with them. I didn't fight with them, but midway through, they were like, "Why did you let us watch this?" And I was like, "Because you asked." <laughs> like, I don't have to prevent you from watching terrible films. It's not a terrible. Film. It it's not terrible. No, I I actually think it's probably. God, am I going to say this? I think it's my favorite of the sequel series. That's everybody. It's been really nice having James on the channel. Um, (laughs) What's the better answer? The world. The first world. Much is like as a movie is like at least thematically cohesive and like paced decently. Oh, I I I don't think it's thematically cohesive. I will say it's a better paced movie, but I I don't think it's thematically cohesive at all. Um, I think it's the most boring. 
World? First one? World. I would say that I would say that World is the most boring, but it's also it works the best as a movie and Fallen Kingdom and Dominion are such train wrecks that At least like, like the people die in fun ways in the first one. Yes, they do. They do. That, they do. That is all I expect out of the sequel of, of like the, those that trilogy is I just want like dinosaurs to do some wacky stuff. I mean, listen. That's a that's a perspective I can respect. I I don't know. There's something about. We talked about this when we did the Indominus Rex recording during the live stream. I find the good movie hidden inside of Jurassic World too frustrating to like the movie. Yeah, I get I get more frustrated with movie with the movie when it is clear that with a couple of script edits, it could have actually been pretty compelling. Mm-hmm. Of course, I, you know, it's much easier to eat, like, a literal piece of sh- Or is it better to eat the piece of sh- that's been smeared in ketchup? I get frustrated that there was nice ketchup on the piece of sh- I eat. You know, Alex, this is not food. It's a movie. Yeah, no, with writing, I, like, I prefer a movie that is so terrible that it is funny to a movie where the scriptwriters were clearly onto something and didn't get there before the final draft was completed. Yeah, but... No, no, no. was edited down by the studios. This is yeah, beside a- the Alex, point. You, Alex, you enjoy really, really <laughs> movies. If we're, fo- if, if, if we're following your food metaphor, it's just... Are sh- to the point of being funny. No, no, but no. what I'm saying is, 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 Alex, if we're following your food metaphor, then you're just like, oh yeah, sometimes I were like a really, really, really incredibly, uh, like, perfectly done steak, and sometimes I would like someone to hit me with a truck. This is the same level of enjoyment out of what I'm getting <laughs> yeah. from this meal. Yeah. Like, the shut the meal, up. this doesn't sometimes work. Sometimes a good meal is I... the good steak, and the other time are Smarties that I have been under a car seat for two years and are ground into a paste that I kind of just like dump out on in my mouth. I'm going to make this pitch. I'm yes. going to make, I'm going to make this pitch actually. And I'm not talking about, um, the second Jurassic world movie, which I, I really don't like. Fall I forget Kingdom, what it's called. Fall Kingdom. Kingdom. The most um, with respect to Jurassic world and, and Jurassic world dominion. If, if you in the audience or in the chat really think these are terrible movies, I implore you to watch some other bad oh, movies yeah. because, Oh, yeah, there's, you if, if this is your bottom floor, I envy you. I have seen oh, yeah, yeah. Yo, ooh, such God, things. No. We we've seen some uh, in like I, such sites to show you. I like again. I don't think these are not god awful films. I just like Jurassic World less. In in yeah, it disappoints point, me more. It disappoints me more. Dominion was like just kind of off the rails from the beginning in a way that I was like, I don't like the premise. Although I did find the idea of using the locust plot as an inciting incident a little... It was almost clever. I wish that the dinosaurs mattered to the plot of the movie, but I think the idea of biotech company as threatening the global food supply is not a bad plot. Right. Mm-hmm. It, it, although, it's I, fine. I, you know what else is good about Dominion, though? It has Overraptor. It has Overraptor in it. It has Overraptor in it. It also was in a movie theater we were in, and Jeff Goldblum was in that theater with us for a moment. True. Yes, so he was. It was an important thing to mention again for our audience. But anyway, Overraptor's in the movie. Alex, what is Overraptor? Overraptor? Yeah. It's second early flight with Bird. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey. Oh my god, Greg. Alex pulls off his mask and it's Greg Paul. <laughs> anyway, um, Overraptor is an Oviraptoro sore. Wow, neat, wild, crazy. Um, these are theropods. You could probably tell, if you're a viewer of our channel, you probably knew that. But just in case, theropods are the bipedal meat eating dinosaurs that give rise to birds, T Rex. T Rex. T Rex. T Rex. We call him T Rex because he's trekking around. In the magical world of the very late early Jurassic and very early middle Jurassic, a lot of important stuff was happening. Very little of it fossilized, (laughs) but (laughs) Oviraptorosaurs originated around then-ish, and they are the first diverging group, uh, clade, of a larger group that we call Peneraptoran. Now, Peneraptorans are kind of silurosaurs, so these are the generally smaller, uh, hollow-boned, more bird-like theropod dinosaurs, with, of course, the exception of Tyrannosaurs, which get very big, as well as some very large Therizinosaurs and Hornthinosaurs, but general trend here. 
Um, within that, we have many subdivisions. There are Manoraptoriforms, Manoraptorans, and then as you keep going up and excluding and excluding and excluding more groups, we get to Peneraptora, and this includes Oviraptorosaurs and Paravians, which are troodontids, dromaeosaurs in the tr traditional sense, uh, and birds, and they're close allies, so Archaeopteryx, uh, and possibly Anchiornithines, and Scansoriopterids, wherever they go. Well, well, I, I might, I have thoughts on Scansoriopterids, but... Well, good, because I'm about to probably also say another thing about them. Okay, good, same thing. We get to Oviraptorosaur, and as as Jimbo kind of alluded to, uh, there are these winged, this, a, a and I mean bizarre little theropod, uh, that exists for approximately two seconds, <laughs> if the fossil record is to be believed in the Jurassic. Um, that includes things like E, Ambopteryx, uh, Scansoriopteryx. I think there are like a half dozen. Of... Yes, yeah, yeah, which is like and then Picrosaurus is a juvenile synonym, I think. Hmm. Epidendrosaurus e. is a juvenile. Juven okay. yeah. But yeah, so there are these long, third-fingered bat, sort of back, bat-winged with weird wrist bones supporting like a flesh wing uh, kind of these little manoraptorans and they look like dragons but like this yes they have weird little heads and some of that anatomy and I, I can't recall off the top of my head exactly what it is has I believe in some analyses they are found as the sister group to oviraptorosaurus or is that just a pet hypothesis of some folk um, so yeah, Scansoriopterigids have been found to be uh, early diverging or over raptorosaurs in several analyses, and importantly, it's been found in unrelated matrices. Yeah. So different research groups have all converged on that answer. That's not universally agreed upon. Um, the f pretty famous or infamous, depending on the research group you're part of, uh, Lori paper describing Hesperornithoides, which had a very kind of, un I shouldn't say unusual, Heterodox phylogenetic hypothesis actually found Scansoriopterigids to be birds. Um, Heterodox, not yeah, not I, like I think as avia. I think they've been found as avians prior to that as well. Yeah, no, it, it's it's happened a couple of times. So they've they've floated around Panoraptora. Yeah, um, I I think an Oviraptor sort of relationship is that's my favorite hypothesis. It seems to just fit with their little short faces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and 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 in that, right? So Peneraptoran, dear viewer, if you know words and the roots of words, you might have realized one we didn't talk about what Oviraptor's name means, which we will we'll get, get to, to that. Um, but Peneraptora means, I guess, pena like roughly penacious thief, right? Yeah, which, feather thief. Feather maybe. thief, which is referring to the big long. A panaceous feather are the big long. Uh, they can be panaceous feathers can be symmetrical, right? They don't have to be asymmetrical. Let me check. Uh, so. I'm almost they, sure they can be. They can be memory yeah. serves. Yeah. I think that they can or be. asymmetrical uh, feathers that have a rachis, long shaft, and then barbs and barbules that create kind of a continuous feather surface. These are the feathers, big feathers on arms of birds, and they're known in dromaeosaurs and troodontids, and in oviraptorosaurs. As you can see on the tail here. And also. they might be farther down the tree in Ornithomimosaurs, but we've talked about that prior. Indeed. In fact, also, the book the, Fe the Feather Thief is really good. Just unrelated. Point, yes. But that book is rad. It's a bonker story. Is it about the dinosaurs or is it just called The Feather Thief? Oh no! It's it's about uh it's about the dude who broke into the the British Museum to ste uh, to pluck a bunch of feathers off of uh like uh prized uh, like study skins and stuff specimens of oh. birds some of them collected by Darwin to make fishing flies. That's cool, cool dude. It's it's insane. It's a bonker story. Um, go on, Alex. Yes. Anyway, which. This would be interesting if Scansoriopterids are in the group because they would have lost these long forearm feathers uh, and made horrible bat wings. Anyway, so right. Oviraptor... Well, and, and, but I think it's worth noting, there's no analysis that ever says they're not Peneraptorans, yes, as far as yeah, I'm aware. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So, they so they like, they're definitely in the group. Regardless. Yeah. Which is weird and stupid, but it is what it is. Right. Um, so we get to Oviraptorosaurs. Their fossil record uh, begins in the early Cretaceous, Though more to come on this, with early some some emerging knowledge about early members is all I'll say. 
But um, yes, so the earliest members of this group, things like Caudipteryx, uh, Incisivosaurus, Simile Caudipteryx, uh, are weird little bird monsters, um, but they are toothed. Not fully along the tooth row, but they have anterior teeth, I believe in the maxilla and premaxilla. Or... Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, they they have a like an abbreviated tooth row, but the, the tooth-bearing bones all have teeth. Mm -hmm. Yes. So in these the are... Yeah. yeah, so things like Caudipteryx, these are the earlier diverging yeah. members. And, because... and then there's a big split... Um, and these are all weird right. edentulous monsters that I'll let James talk about. Before, edentulous meaning no teeth. Yes. Before we get into no teeth, because we'll never get a chance to talk about it again, probably, Incisivosaurus is named after my advisor. Gotcha. Uh, wait, go really? Ahead. Incisivosaurus oh. Godiei. Yeah, bro. Yeah. Oh, what a, what a beautiful animal to be named, to be named yourself, after bro. you. <laughs> Genuinely, uh, one of the most off-putting looking dinosaurs I've ever seen. It's a it's a terrible, it's ugly great. monster. Really, overaptorosaurs for me are a, they're a difficult group to get a handle on because, in some angles and from some perspectives, they can be beautiful, and from others, they're like demons straight from the pit of hell. I I can't really reconcile it. They're very very <laughs> interesting animals. So. I did a lot of my PhD working on Oviraptorosaurs. I'm going to keep a lot of the details on this kind of brief, but within Oviraptorosaurs there are two major groups. Um, one of them are Canignathids, and the other are Oviraptorids. Canignathids are all united by a snapomorphy, so a shared derived trait, which is that upon death, their bodies exploded. <laughs> scattering their fossil material over miles of area, and meaning that we never find their skeletons. Detonated like a joke. hand grenade. They had, um, they had martyrdom. What'd you say, <laughs> what'd you say, Alex? So this, dear viewer, is a joke. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I, yeah. I, you, know, you, said a, you said an important science word, and then you said a joke, and I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. It, it is a joke. We, is, Canignathids have a remarkably spotty fossil record. Most of the material we find from them are the metatarsal bones and the feet. We occasionally find their mandibles. There are very few well-known or well-understood Canignathids. Um, the best one that's really been published on a lot is Anzu, which comes from the latest Cretaceous of North America. It would have lived with T-Rex. Um, a few weeks ago, I actually had the pleasure of studying Anzu's material firsthand. I was doing a collections visit at the Carnegie Museum where it's held. I had finished my work on Tyrannosaurus, so I spent a couple of hours with it. And it's a very nice fossil, but Canignathid material, when it's complete, is also generally pretty deformed, pretty crushed. Like, the original morphology is not really preserved. There's a lot of interpretation you need to do on it. Canignathids are not going to be a focus of this video, um, partially because I don't know a tremendous amount about them relative to Oviraptorids. Partially because we don't, yeah, partially because there's there's no representation in the game and they are not extremely well understood animals. The one thing I do want to note is that early in their evolutionary history, there appear to have been a subgroup, maybe, or maybe repeated events of this, of enormous canignathids. Um, Gigantoraptor is the only one that's named right now. There are eggs from North America that are, I think, as big or bigger. Cool. So... These are these weird phantoms that are just not mm -hmm. fossilizing. They are f***ing huge. <laughs> Enormous. G Gigantoraptor is like T-Rex size. It's it like T-Rex size. size. It's a T-Rex sized animal. It, it, Probably not as thing. heavy, but like... Oh, oh yeah, 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 not as heavy, but, but in like, terms of height. Put them next to each other and you'd be like... Where is the, where's the nesting one from? Where, I'm sorry, where are the eggs from for North America? Southwest? Mustn't touch it, Utah. How old? They're, they're like uh, about a hundred. Cool. Yeah. Oh, I'm I'm getting it confused with the North American Dinochirid. Yes. No. 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 That's from the Southwest, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so another so, big weird T. Rex size that right. shouldn't exist. Right. So Canignathids have a lot of interesting stuff in their history, but moving along, we want to talk about Oviraptorids. Oviraptorids are only known from Central Asia where they are incredibly diverse. We have a rich, rich, rich fossil record of things that are closely related to Oviraptor. Um, they are generally in, they are generally treated as, or generally considered to be crested animals. Um, and they're mo mostly diagnosed by having a kind of shorter face with a much more robust lower jaw. Candidates have this long, kind of scoop-like lower jaw. 
Canignathids are also crested. Crest development happens multiple times within these animals. James said earlier that there's some reconstructions and some like angles and stuff where some oviraptorsaurs can just be absolutely gorgeous looking. In my opinion, those are only the Kenignathids. Um, <laughs> all of the oviraptorids look busted and goofy in many ways that are endearing. Some ways that are incredibly not. But like a lot of reconstructions of mo a lot of Kenignathids are very, very pretty. Yeah, but I think that's because we have a lot of artistic license. We don't know. <laughs> we, we haven't found out how far they are yet. Right. Oviraptor to create beauty. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, the exactly. desire to create ugliness. Yeah, but Anzu's, Anzu's skull is pretty incomplete. Like, it's been reconstructed in a way that's pretty. I mean, we kind of have an. Uh, uh, you know the material more than I do, so. It, we have enough to get the shape, but there's a lot of interpretation into what it exactly looked like. Which, you know. I mean, it's not like we've got nothing. It's not fake. It's just like, yeah. you know, you gotta, you gotta do a little bit of interpretation. I think there's a human desire to make it a little prettier. The Overaptor fossil I mean, look record. Look at this thing. Right, 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 exactly. <laughs> the Overaptor fossil record is stunning. These animals are commonly found in just these, like the specimens we find are beautifully preserved, articulated, almost complete. Um, and the first one found in the Gobi was found in the early 1920s by the American Museum of Natural History's Central Asiatic Expeditions during their visit to the Flaming Cliffs, a location in Mongolia known as Bain Zak. Um, Beinzak is also where they found the holotype specimen of Velociraptor and where they found the holotype specimen of Protoceratops and where they found the holotype specimen of Sauronithoides Sauronithoides, yeah Sauronithoides and it was found by a pretty pretty iconic dude Yeah. you mean Peter Kaizen? <laughs> yes, a fossil preparator <laughs> yes, He's it was doing rad <laughs> as fossil preparators do Yes. Um, Peter Kaizen is actually the person who found all of these things. To my understanding, they were all found on the same day. They're just walking down the flaming <laughs> what cliffs. A just, what a day. Just, pull, just pulling amazing stuff out of the rock. Um, when I, I mean, grow is, up, I want to be like Peter Kaizen. <laughs> right. I mean, this is what people talk about in like these really rich Gobi localities. Like When I was talking to Jim Kirkland about this, he said, yeah, I went to the flaming cliffs, and within 45 minutes, I found a velociraptor skull. God damn it. I, I mean, it's just like, like it's That's insane. Cool. Yeah. Um, so, Oviraptor was found... Uh, it, the, the Oviraptor specimen is actually one of the worst preserved Oviraptorid specimens. Yeah. Oh, it's bad. It's not in great shape. Um, I think it had been exposed to the surface for a while, a lot eroded away, the skull was pretty broken up. James, was... I remember when you showed me the holotype one time at the AMNH, and I, I, I think that the phrase that I used when... Uh, you pulled it out was at least at first I think it was holy <laughs> uh, and then it was it looks like uh, I, I think I asked you if this was like exactly how it was found because it looks like there, there's so many we'll throw it up on screen um, it looks like if you found the skull of an oviraptor smashed it into tiny little like like half an inch square pieces and then tried to extrude it out to make it look like the skull of a somewhat normal reasonable theropod <laughs> and fail. Well, that's what God did to that skull. Well, well, because there, there's a lot of... Yeah, well, th my question was essentially, is this something that God did to this unfortunate animal and made it just look busted or did they find a bunch of these pieces and just go this thing's f***ed we must be missing some stuff and fill in with some matrix in between to be like oh it should probably look like this yeah I mean it is possible that a little reconstruction was done I don't know so one of my lingering old threads from the PhD is CT scanning that skull and doing a reanalysis to see if we can figure out anything else about it um, maybe in the future I'll be able to say more about it, but right now I can't. So, um, there's a couple of interesting things about Oviraptor, but the famous story that we need to tell, I'm going to give to Scott. 
because I've talked about oviraptors for too long now. I'll talk more about their biology afterward. However, I want to mention one thing. The famous figure we were going to discuss is Roy Chapman Andrews. Roy Chapman Andrews is a very important figure in vertebrate paleontology and in the AMNH. He was the expedition leader for the Central Asiatic Expeditions. He was mostly a mammologist. A lot of his career was actually spent studying whales. Um, and he was looking for mammal fossils. And poor guy just kept finding the most amazing dinosaur fossils that had ever been discovered and having to collect oh, them for the A and H. I know, so sad for him. <laughs> Roy Chapman Andrews is famous a lot, or is mentioned a lot, because he was apparently the inspiration for Indiana Jones. Wrong. It's not true. It's not. It's not true. Not only is Indiana Jones based on old adventure serial characters from the 1930s, but literally there's no piece of documentation that anybody making that movie even knew about Roy Chapman Andrews. They never cared. He just wore a similar hat. <laughs> so there's a possibility. That like maybe some of the adventure serials were inspired. I've heard that, that there's a chance that some of the maybe. adventure serials might have been. I, I just don't know if he was really that much of like a, if his image was that much of a figure at that point. I mean, he did do some bonkers. Like, I mean, and at least one of the stories that I had heard about Andrews and his expedition, and again, this this is one of the most incredibly ridiculous things I've ever heard, so it is almost certainly apocryphal, but that uh, in going to one of the expedition sites, they came across the, uh, the uh, a battle and basically kind of had the thought of just like, all right, so we, we have like kind of two options just like either we sit tight here and wait for the battle to be done which we have no idea how long that's going to take or we try to drive around it which we kind of have no idea what the battle lines are they could be moving we that, that doesn't really seem like the best idea either and uh at least the story i heard was andrews basically had a thought of hey i have a third idea what if we just fly an Amer uh, the biggest american flag we can off of our field vehicles and if they shoot us it's an international incident <laughs> he sounds like a cool guy. That's pretty neat. It is. I have no idea if this is a real story, but uh, like Andrews, for for the viewers, Andrews is a bit of a mythical figure in vertebrate paleontology. Like it, it's one of those things of like I've heard like like sixty stories about the guy, and I would wager that maybe ten are true. Um, yeah. I actually know that when um, I think Mark Norell and Lowell Dingus at the AM and H, right? Mark Norell was my doctoral supervisor. They wrote a book about him, and I think they were actually able to track down some like very old socialites in New York who were still alive who had met him. Hmm. Hmm. Um, I don't know how many of the stories they were actually able to corroborate. I, I, you know, Andrews is somebody we kind of ascribe things to a lot. I think you he know. did some of that himself too. Oh sure. yeah, I mean. A lot of these people were big self-promoters, and to some degree they had to be. You, you understand it. Um, like, one story about him that's definitely gotten exaggerated is that he, quote-unquote, worked his way up from being a janitor to being president of the museum. Um, and what had happened is that he had a degree in mammology. I believe he had a PhD in mammology at the time, although he may have worked on it while he worked at the AM and H. But he was like a trained inspector, just as shining as they are today. <laughs> right. Well, he was a tra he was like a trained mammologist and everything, trained taxidermist. He had done taxidermy to pay for school, um, and he wanted a job at the AM and H, and they didn't have any openings in the mammology department. And that's why he took a janitorial position because he did just want to work there and be around. Cool. So it's not that he was like untrained and kind of worked his way up in a very rags to riches way. Like he already had the schooling. It was just like, I would like to be at the institution and be around so that when a job is open, they will choose me. And that's exactly what happened. So he did work his way up a bit, but you know, it's not quite the mythical American bootstrap story that it's always told as. Mm -hmm. It's an Speaking American Bremer also... story. What is it? I said it's an American Bremer story. Right, right. <laughs> More of an speaking, American jackknife story. <laughs> speaking also of, uh, like, corroborating stories about Andrews, uh, this just reminds me of, at my first SVP um, uh, in Salt Lake City, Dalton, you remember how they had that really, really, actually, James was there, too. Uh, Alex, were you there, too? 
At Salt Lake? Yeah. No. Okay, so the three of us. Do you remember um, in the, like, posters and, like, exhibition hall that they had that really awesome bookstore? Yes. Oh, my God. They had just... And I thought that, like, it was so well done. I thought that that was, like, something that was that must have been solid for every uh, for every SVP, and they've never had a good one since. No, they had it at Albuquerque. Just... The one I missed! Because so so they I, haven't had a... I learned, that, one at... I learned that they, like, only ever do them at the domestic ones because it's just too expensive for them to oh, move their merchandise, sense. like, internationally. And we haven't really had okay. a big domestic SVP since Albuquerque. Oh, well, we will in the not-too-distant yeah. future. But, um, so, anyways, uh, I was looking through all the books, and I ended up actually picking up a, um, a book on Andrews, uh, and when I picked it up, the, the guy who was running this, uh, the stand who was checking me out um, said that uh, a while back, when he was relatively early at um, SVP, he actually like in setting up some books he ran into a guy who mentioned he was just like oh yeah i actually i met andrews back in the day it was like like happened to have lunch with him like several years back hmm. and and he he said he like almost dropped the books he was holding and he was just like oh my god really uh, what was he like tell me everything and the guy just like sat there he was like he was a really old dude uh, he just like sat there for a couple minutes, like staring off into the middle distance, and he looked back and he was like, "I think he ordered a ham sandwich," and then he left. <laughs> well, no, and then the guy who was telling the story just yeah. left. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, right? Like we think about these people as existing a long time ago, and it is about to be the hundredth anniversary of the like fossil discoveries at the Flaming Cliffs. Mongolia is throwing a huge celebration in in honor of the event. Um, that's going to happen in, like a week from this recording. Um, but Andrews died in 1960. Like, my dad was alive. Yep. Right? Like, this is not... It, it's not generations ago. Mm-hmm. He's buried in Beloit. Which is where he's from. Yeah. Where is yeah. Beloit? Is buried? It's Wisconsin. Oh, okay. So anyway, okay, right, I'm so... going gonna, gonna to intervene and tell the historical story. Because... <laughs> we, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay. So, over after... Um, is famous for one very specific story that uh, gave the animal its name and therefore the whole group its names. And if you're a paleo fan, you've probably heard it before, but it's a fun one. So in uh, during the Central Asiatic Expeditions, I believe it was the second or third one um, that uh, this was actually discovered. Well, actually, I'm backing up. Uh, in one of the first ones... Uh, Andrews made an incredibly important discovery, which was the first ever fossilized dinosaur eggs. And these were attributed to an incredibly common dinosaur that they were finding all over the place in Mongolia, Protoceratops. You know them, you love it. Um, I mean, Protoceratops is still one of the best sampled dinosaurs. Like, we, we know yeah. an amazing amount about its biology. We, we know, like, it, it is the only dinosaur at least that I know of that we have such an incredible complete growth stage of like pre-hatched embryos all the way up to like incredibly old mature adults. Yeah. No, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. And a lot of that was found in the twenties, right? Like it was insane. It was one of the animals that actually started this study of dinosaur ontogeny in like Barnum Brown and, um, Eric Schleicher's paper on its anatomy, they were actually talking about ontogeny a lot because they were just like, we got a whole growth series of them so we can actually mm-hmm. talk about growth changes. And that's where the circle of hell that I reside in uh, was started. So it's it's Protoceratops' Thanks. fault that I'm a person in this field. Yes. Yeah. How dare. Yeah, yeah. How so, dare. Um, so, found these eggs near all these Protoceratops. Two and two. Hey, Protoceratops eggs. Super cool. And uh, that was one of the big things that made Andrews kind of a more, like, widely known uh, personality as well. Because I mean, it was, like, it was the most notable find from the discoveries, or from the expeditions, I think, at that time. No, but I, I mean, also, he, like, he, he peddled around, like, the, the dinosaur eggs all over the place and actually uh, sold a bunch of them personally. It was, it's, it's mm, a, little, a little gray in that bit, but... Um, 
It's not the only thing he did that was incredibly gross. I was about to say, but... if you think he did that bit, that if you think he did one bad thing, just wait until you hear what we're going to edit out of this discussion right now. So, uh, so uh, uh, later on, um, um, I believe it was the second or third um, expedition, Andrews, uh, well, I guess Peter Kyson, finds this skeleton of the most bonkers, weird, goofy-ass dinosaur you've ever seen in your entire life that doesn't look anything like anything that anyone has found previous. And what was n notable about this animal, besides being just weird-looking, uh, was that it was laying on top of a nest of eggs. In fact, it was... And when I say on top, I don't just mean it was kind of like relatively close by maybe something was laying on it i mean it was directly on top with just a couple centimeters of sediment separating the eggs from the animal so this thing almost assuredly was like on those eggs when um when the whole thing was buried uh so uh this incredible specimen was dug up and sent back to new york and it was uh, n described and named by fellow unproblematic king Henry Fairfield Osborne. <laughs> Friend of the channel, Henry Fairfield Osborne. I'll that. Noted super racist <laughs> Henry Fairfield Osborne. Right. When we say super racist, if, if you two of you are, are somebody who's inclined to think that people talking about historical racism are like, you know, woke weirdos who are like no fun killjoys, we all let me be clear. Well. Uh, let me be clear. What'd you say? Don't watch our channel. Right. Yeah. Not uh, yours. Right. Um, Freaks. When we say Henry Fairfield Osborne was a super racist, we don't mean he's a guy who lived in the 1920s. No. We mean he's a guy who founded the American Eugenics Society. <laughs> like, he is we, racist. We say <laughs> that he was the director of the American Museum of Natural History and ensured that its display on the evolution of humans culminated in a white Englishman skull in the case as literally the pinnacle of evolution man was bonkers insane also low-key not a very good scientist uh, he was very wealthy and was trained by good people and wasn't that good himself um if credit has to be given where credit's due which i'm loath to do for henry Fairfield osborne but i think it's important to note he is the person who made the American Museum of Natural History a force in paleontology. This is mostly because he was very wealthy. He was from a railroad tycoon family, and he had a lot of contacts with other wealthy people, so he was able to get a lot of money to fund expeditions to get fossils. And the AMNH went from having essentially no paleontological collection to the most important dinosaur collection in the world. Um, that's the only good thing I'll say about Henry Fairfield Lawson. He... His, his scientific influence lasts only because he was the first person to have access to a lot of this material. And therefore, he's the person named Velociraptor and T-Rex and Oviraptor. The only, the only other things. good thing that I'll say about him is, man, dude could name a dinosaur. Yeah, he had good name sets. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, my favorite thing about him is that he took a perfectly good T-Rex brain case and diamond sawed it in half. He wanted to look at the endocast. He couldn't do it at the time. I mean, you can't see T scan, and it's 1912. Not with that attitude. <laughs> right. He's, oh my God. He's such, so, oh, the, he gets a fossil. He's such a fucking eugenicist. He's like, how many beans can fit in this skull? <laughs> I'm going to fill it. T Rex has the. Huh? Mustard about seeds. Three more beans than your average Dutchman. <laughs> 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 so it was very so I was at the AMNH for a few days earlier this week. I, I just my visit there ended yesterday, um, and I was studying Tyrannosaur material there. And one of the things I looked at was AMNH fifty one seventeen, which is another T Rex brain case, not the one he cut in half. Um, it was left intact. It's actually from a fairly small individual, um, and he did what a lot of paleontologists did at the time, and he wrote they wrote on it with like paint. You can actually see that on a lot of specimens at the AMNH. We still do it today. Right we just do it nicer. <laughs> well, we do it in, a, in an archival way, not like just spackling on letters like, yeah, this is what I think that is. Uh -huh. um, but a lot of things at the AM&H were written on like that during their study, and then they were put on exhibit back when you know people thought the public needs to know that's the ectoterragoid. Make sure you write ECT period on it. That'll tell the public. 
the New York street urchins will be like, ah, oh, yeah, that's the ectoterragoid. It's like the uh, the people who made the original Peabody put a put a big old phytosaur skull in the cabinet, and then just above it wrote phytosaur, and nothing else. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, there you go. That's what it is. They're not it's fucking. That, you know, they're not. It's not their job to hold your hand. <laughs> It's okay. D- two things on that. One, isn't that what the um, like the Tylosaurus at the AMNH? It has all that mm-hmm. stuff labeled as well. Mm-hmm. That um, I'm, I'm channeling Amelia when I say this. Um, and the second thing is, speaking of museums not wanting to hold your hand, uh, I saw the most. This is unrelated, but I saw the most baffling exhibit at the Boston Museum of Science um, several weeks ago, where they have mm-hmm. these gorgeous displays of like local taxidermized birds um in these very nice display cases like kind of segregated by the environments that you would find them in none of which have labels and they specifically have a sign on there that's like birds in nature don't have labels on them and i've never oh, been that's so stupid so irrationally angry at a, at a museum <laughs> exhibit before they do have I, and, until i turned around and it was just like oh no they have like identification cards and it's like a whole like exercise on like how to identify a bird in the wild thing and i'm like all right I'm better now than for us. <laughs> right. I was just like, I'm gonna fight somebody. So, so like AMNH 5027 is all written on, but and that's the famous AMNH T Rex skeleton that's on display. Um, and but, in the and in the logo for this game, yeah. right in the logo for this game and everything in the Jurassic Park franchise. But more importantly, AMNH 5117 is this T Rex brain case, and Osborne labeled his identifications of every hole and foramen and recess on the brain case, mm-hmm. and I do not, none of them are right. <laughs> Good job, King. <laughs> he, he labeled one of the bones kind of correctly, by which I mean it's reasonable to call the latter a sphenoid and orbit a sphenoid at that point. Um... <laughs> Because I, the term latter sphenoid wasn't in widespread use. <laughs> Everything else was incorrect, except for he got, this is where the olfactory tract, the largest part of the brain and an obvious thing. Nice. He was like, that's for the olfactory tract. Everything else was wrong. It, and it, it, it is it, wonderful because Larry Whitmer, a, a very good scientist, left a f- <laughs> translation card in the drawer with it. <laughs> Where he was just like, all right, everything on this is wrong. Here's the correct identification of literally every That's feature a, on the skull. <laughs> That's a chat damn. Name. Osborne, my, legacy, my legacy is complete gibberish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Osborne was not a good scientist. Anyway, Scott, go so, ahead. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll wrap up this story quickly. But so um, Osborne uh, ended up naming this um, goofy dinosaur laying on a nest of eggs. Uh, Oviraptor philoceratops, which specifically translates out to uh, the egg thief that likes ceratopsians, um, because again, it was thought that this uh, that this thing was a specialized egg eater that was killed in the act of stealing eggs from a protoceratops nest um that would explain like how absolutely strange all of its anatomy was it was just like oh of course it looks weird like it has this big heavy beak it has these kind of this this stalactite of bone in the middle of its jaw like oh this uh, or the middle of its like roof of its mouth oh this this thing was made for like cracking and eating eggs like all the time and it would steal them from uh protoceratops nests and so thus the name over after was born and then, uh, and, and it was always depicted as an egg stealing, egg eating dinosaur for decades upon decades. I need to leap in here because okay. this also gets into a little bit about the historical understanding of this animal, which is that it wasn't understood to be the first member of a new group yet. Mm. This is partially because the material was actually so poorly preserved. Um, what Osborne noted, and this is not completely wrong is that it had some similarities to ornithomimosaurs. And so he thought it was an ornithomimosaur. He also noted similarities, as Dalton pointed out in the pre-recording little huddle we did, um, that it had similarities to an animal called Chirostenodes. Chirostenodes at the time was a chimera with the hands of a canignathid oviraptorosaur and the mandibles of a dromaeosaur. So... Osborne didn't think it was a particularly close relative because it lo- he you know he was like that one's a normal predator with big hands and this thing's weird as shit. Um, 
early depictions of Oviraptor, like I've got one of my uh, childhood favorite dinosaur books is actually a book my mom had as a kid. It all it has all these illustrations from Zalinger that were mm. like you know you know of the age of reptiles mural at the Peabody fame. But he did all of these different paintings for this book. And Ornithalestes is in it, and it's just... Oh, I'm sorry, not Ornithalestes. Oviraptor is in it, and it's depicted just as an Ornithomimosaur. Um, huh. Maybe with a little bit of a thing on yeah, the Yeah, it has nose, a little, like, horn. Partial. Yeah, it has a little horn, because there's a little bit of a bone fragment there that's given the indication of a horn to some prior workers. Um, so that changed as more Oviraptorosaur material was found in the 70s and 80s. Um, this is when people really started working in the Gobi again. It was Polish teams and Mongolian teams with Rinchen Barsbold as kind of the man keeping Mongolian paleontology going for a long time. And making in parallel with Western scientists discovering the dinosaur bird link gradually, making all of the same realizations himself, but publishing in Russian in Russian journals. So Americans were not aware and British scientists were not really aware of his work. It's kind of as digital file sharing has become more common and digital translations available that there's been more cross pollination and people realize that at the same time that people like Bakker and John Ostrom and later Jacques Godier and Mark Norell and all of these people were making the dinosaur bird connection. Um, uh, Rinchen Barsbold was as well. I um, also, I want to, I want to interject here for just a hot second because I just looked up uh, old uh, over Raptorsaur art and was greeted by this depiction that I just found from uh, a, a blog post in Love in the Time of Casposaurus from 1960 that is the most baffling depiction of Over Raptor I've ever seen and I am going to put it in our group chat so y'all can see it and I think that this is old enough that we can throw it up on screen too feast your eyes everybody Oh God! Dang. Do I have to? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, yeah. I'm a little creepazole. <laughs> Look at this thing. That's great. <laughs> Ooh. This this is from a book called Discovering Dinosaurs by Glenn O. Bloch. I have no idea how to pronounce <laughs> that name. <laughs> it's funny because that's actually just a very good portrait of Henry Fairfield Osborne. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. Mm. I'm trying to see how many eggs he can get into the cranial cavity. He's like his Marvel namesake. He's the green goblin. He's gobbling up all the <laughs> eggs. Yeah, but I guess this stands to show we didn't really understand what this animal was like. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah. later years, um, like over the course of the many years that um, the paleontologists were finding fossils in Mongolia, uh, they kept finding these and specifically they kept finding over raptorosaurs on nests of eggs this is not quite it was a while before one was found again okay it was yes okay. yeah so i mean the first one that was i don't believe any of the material found by the polish or mongolian crews in the 70s and 80s were nesting oh, um okay yeah. No, I think they were finding more specimens and they were realizing that they were a distinct group. But Okay. Um the and uh, the first new nesting of Raptorosaur was a Cytopody specimen that was found by the AMNH teams when they went back to Mongolia in the 90s. Um gotcha. Oh, I was yes, under so, the impression that they found a couple more in years prior and it was no, just I don't, kind of like I don't believe enforcing so. that idea. I don't believe huh. so, no. Right. It was all based on the first one. And so, you know, this is a very special story to those of us who are AM and H affiliated because, you know, there was a time where the name Mark Norell did not conjure images of being uh, pretty much unequivocally the most important living vertebrate paleontologist. Right. I mean, like, that's mm -hmm. not disparaging anybody. That's just Mark is insanely productive and insanely influential, and it's been behind a lot of really important revelations of dinosaur paleo. There was a time, though, where he was an early career researcher who hadn't yet made his mark. No yeah. pun intended. Um, and he was a new curator at the AMNH. They had just finished renovating the halls of uh, fossils. He was involved in that, although that process had, I think, started before he was there and was mostly supervised by Eugene Gaffney, who was a turtle paleontologist. Um, Mark and Mike Novacek started the, the new AMNH, Mongolian Academy of Sciences, joint expeditions to Mongolia. Um, 
And after a couple of years of finding good stuff, but not a lot of stuff, they stumbled upon this fossil locality um, called Ukatolga, which just is Mongolian for little brown hills. And it was an area that had almost been found by the Polish teams. They were, I think, within two kilometers of it and never found it. Um, it was like just over a rise they'd never explored over. Um, and it's Man. it's just one of... And I think they were upset. When they yeah, bet. Oh, I bet. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was one of the richest fossil localities that's ever been located. Um, hundreds upon hundreds of specimens. Mammals many species of mammals, many species of lizards, an incredible stage, like incredible preservation, a couple species of troodontid, a dromaeosaur, at least one dromaeosaur, um, and what appear to be two species of oviraptorosaur, a large one called Cytopodi, a small one called Khan. The first published speci specimen of Cytopodi, which wasn't even named at the time it was first described in the literature, um, was in a paper in Nature in 1994, just entitled A Nesting Dinosaur. And it was a landmark study. 1994, good year. <laughs> good year, right. Um, what they found was that this animal was preserved in association with a nest of eggs in a brooding position. So clearly doing an avian-style thing where it's sitting over the nest, its arms are spread over the eggs, it's right in the middle, clearly mimicking birds on a nest. What was critically important is that another one of these large eggs was found cracked open with the embryonic skeleton preserved inside. And the embryonic skeleton, despite being a little jumbled, was clearly a oviraptor or skeleton. The obvious conclusion there being that, uh, you know, if this, this is a typified behavior that these animals are doing, that they're, they're sitting on their nests and sitting on their eggs, that the prior specimen of oviraptor that had been found also on top of a nest of eggs, and especially because the eggs look the same, or at least very similar, they're kind of these long ovals, um, that it was not stealing the eggs of a protoceratops, and that those were not protoceratops eggs, but they were the eggs of Oviraptor, and it was sitting on its own nest. And so it, it was, unfor well, yeah, it unfortunately got the name Egg Thief, the lover of ceratopsians, despite the fact that it was not stealing eggs, uh, nor were those eggs the eggs of a ceratopsian. And, and Protoceratops was probably a nasty animal with a bad bite, and I don't think it liked it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think anything liked it. I don't think yeah. anything liked Well, Velociraptor loved yeah. it. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. But, um, um, yes, Scott, was, go ahead. This was Sorry. also kind of uh, more so put to a T a couple of years ago when it was discovered that uh, uh, the real protoceratops eggs, it, it's, it's just more of the nail in the coffin of like, like not only did we look at these eggs and just go, oh, wow, these are similar to other oviraptorosaur eggs we found that are definitely oviraptorosaur eggs because they were brooding them and there were baby oviraptors in them. So they're probably right. oviraptor eggs. But also years later, we found out that like, hey, we've never really found protoceratops eggs and the only ones that we have are like tiny little fragments of things because they were soft. Well, yeah. and I think one of them, like there's a, there's a group of what appear to be embryonic protos now, and there's like a halo of eggshell around them. It's a very, very faint indication. As found um, by Yale's very own. Yeah. Yes, me know. And, and, and Mateo. And Mateo, yeah, Yale's two very own. Yes, and and, uh, and of course Yale's very own Mark, Dr. Mark Norell, uh, yeah. who was lead author on the paper, right? But yeah, who was also Yale's very own? He did his PhD at Yale. Um, Everyone good did their PhD here. Yeah, but he also made took pains to just like explain the fact that he was not in the geology and geophysics department. <laughs> 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 Apparently, all of the like Yale, like a bunch of Yale, like geology newsletters have Mark in them. And he had to keep writing them. He was like, I didn't graduate from that department. That's it's never a part of it. That's great. <laughs> it's like, stop taking credit. I was in bio. He, his, uh, his wife, though, she, she was in, right? Viv? Right. She was, she was in geology. Yeah, she was a geochemist. 
we could do our own video on it. It's an interesting like, evolutionary story. Yeah, it's it's more essentially not to bury the lead, but it, they're more uh, crocodile like, where they're a bit more like leathery. Yeah, and I think they make the argument that hadrosaur no hadrosaur eggs are mineralized. Yeah, right? hadrosaur eggs are mineralized sauropod eggs and theropod eggs, and it looks like those might be three independent uh, yeah. mineralizations of the egg. Yeah, I was about yeah. to say, our, we, we know that sauropod eggs are pretty well mineralized because they fossilize relatively frequently. So, so ceratopsian eggs are probably soft, which actually explains why they are basically never found, mm -hmm. right? The protoceratops embryos w were thought to be neonatal specimens that were recently hatched. Um, but the halo of eggshell around them shows that they're actually like very, very well-developed embryos that were probably close to hatching. Mm -hmm. Um but like in North America, with all of the ceratopsians we have, we have no eggshell that's yeah. actually attributed to them. Um, well, we have eggshell of a lot of other groups. Um, so oviraptorosaurs. I want to briefly talk about one aspect of oviraptor that I think is worth mentioning, which is the head crest. Ooh. Ooh. There's Ooh. no evidence it had one. Oh. Um. That's it. <laughs> well, or cetipati. Uh, well, or cetipati, right. So this is... The skull of this animal is based on an undescribed oviraptor specimen that was actually discovered in the, I think, the late 70s or early 80s. I think we could be a bit more general with that. The skull of every yeah. single <laughs> animal that you've ever seen labeled as oviraptor? Yes, it is is based on one specimen. It's MPC-D100-42. Um, uh, rolls right catchy. off the tongue. It rolls right off the tongue. Well, so the acronym for the... The collection code in the Mongolian Academy has changed a few times, but it's currently MPC D. Um, so this specimen, um, MPC D 142, is the first really well preserved oviraptorid that was found in Mongolia. And it it's became the basis. Gorgeous. It's a gorgeous specimen. And it's the basis for, as Scott said, literally every single depiction of oviraptor after the 1980s. Yep. Uh, Disney's Dinosaur, if you've seen that movie, which I'm sure you have if you watch our channel. Um, a lot of dinosaur books from when I was a kid. The Oviraptors in Dinosaur Planet. The Oviraptor in Jurassic World Dominion. The Oviraptor in Jurassic World Evolution 2. Uh, the Oviraptor in, in a rare prehistoric kingdom, L. The Oviraptor in prehistoric kingdoms yes. that they've shown in that so far isn't in game, but mm. they've shown in concept art from back in the day, and it is. It's that one. It's not Oviraptor, right? Um, that that skull also has become the model for Cidipati in a lot of depictions. Um, Which also, fun fact: see right. above section. <laughs> right, see above section. Cidipati, um did not have a skull. It, it didn't um, have a skull. I know it had a skull. It had a skull. It, had a skull. it was skull. just a oh neck that opened to the air. <laughs> it had a the world, there there was a grab to squirt sperm out of its cloaca <laughs> on top of another one, and the group just evolved a headless clay. <laughs> Jurassic um, World Dominion was correct. It just ran around like. It, yeah, it would it would open up like a flower. <laughs> yeah. So. So. <laughs> Okay, Cidipati did have a skull. Cidipati did not have a cranial crest, or Cidipati osmolska, right? The, that species. It has been floated in literature for over 20 years that this IgM, or MPCD-142 specimen, is another species of Cidipati. It has not been described. That is work that will be forthcoming, is all that I can say about it. Um, so it, it's currently an unnamed specimen. The cool. real oviraptor skull is quite damaged. I can't determine if it had a cranial crest or not, but my inclination is that there's no evidence that it did. So it probably would look more like Cidipati or Khan or Conqueraptor. We'll flash these skulls up on screen so you can see what a crestless oviraptor skull look like. But it's really just if you continue the profile with the downward curve of the skull without the crest. Mm -hmm. That's we'll what also it... flash up uh, Hank's fantastic reconstruction. Of Cidipati, yeah. right, which of shows Cidipati. it with no crest. And it shows a, it in a, all of its question. awful alien glory. Yes, Alex. And I definitely don't know the answer to, and I'm not using it as a segue. Would the crests be, you know, if this were the animal it is depicted, uh, it, would the crest be keratinous and shiny? Probably not. Huh. 
Well, what? sorry. Yeah, no, ahead. let me let me rephrase. I haven't studied the material of things with very tall cranial crests, mm -hmm. but the ones with shorter cranial crests, I don't think that they would have been particularly like a cassowary's cask mm -hmm. in real life, which is clearly the design inspiration that's going on here. Um, also, the design inspiration in uh, prehistoric planet with Caretha Raptor, which is a crested over raptor. Mm -hmm. um, that's its name. Right, Caretha Raptor, right, helmeted thief. Um, and Caretha Raptor is seemingly a close relative of Cinepati. There does seem to be a general trend in a lot of these lineages toward head crest development. And but, are we just saying this for no reason, or is there a reason that we think that maybe this structure might have been covered with softer tissues? There is a reason. I don't. What are you getting at? Because I don't know if it's published or oh, something, just that something it's I like can't talk about. Like incredibly pneumatized and like would be continuous with the sinuses. Yeah, I think that's a fair point, right? So if you want to mention that, you you can in a different. That, this way. is me mentioning it. They, okay, got it. Got it. Those are yeah. And then there's upcoming work by a guy we know that's going to be important on this. But yeah, we can't talk do. about it yet. Right. Yes. Go Rams. This, this is an interesting. It, it, it's an interesting system. Go Rams. Um, there's one other thing that I want to mention about this design. Its arms are really small. They're not feathered correctly, which is its own yeah. problem. But overaptorosaurs in general have huge hands with gigantic f off claws on them. Citipati is a fairly large animal for an overaptor, so it's nowhere near gigantoraptor size. But it's like, you know, emu size. Maybe Scott, would you say bigger. that? Uh, yeah, I'd say about emu size. Yeah, yeah, e emu sized animal. Every claw on its hand is bigger than Velociraptor's killing claw. They are they are wickedly hooked. The fingers are long, and they just end in these gigantic meat hooks. Well, actually, James, I I, I could say we could at least tell this story. That was wasn't wasn't it when you were like giving a tour for like uh, was it Megan that you were Might showing around the place? When we were talking about Cidipati and like how large it was, and uh, I believe I, I said the phrase that it was like, it's a big enough animal that if one just appeared behind you in a dark alley, your response would be, ah! <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. I, it, I don't know if that was Megan or if I was... At the end. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's how we describe how large animals are. How would you, how would you respond to them in an alley? <laughs> It would be startling. I think over after sores, especially like larger ones like Cidipati, and I should note, Cidipati is maybe about twice as big as over after, based on comparable skeletal elements. Like over after is not a particularly large individual, not a particularly large animal. Would you say that this is about the right size for over after? <sighs> it seems maybe. a touch small. It's a touch small, um, but it's not remarkably far hmm. off. Overactor was a little guy, um, not not tiny, not like you know cat sized, but I don't know, like Velociraptor sized. A, a, maybe a little bit bigger than that. The skull is the skull's maybe a little longer, a little bit bigger than Velociraptor. I'm trying to think of a modern animal that might be a good analog, like a Coyote. like a bi a big dog, mm -hmm. I, maybe a wolf in terms of like body mass. But Cinepati's like big. You know, so the body really weighs as much as a wolf. May, uh, maybe less. I have no Way, idea how much a wolf in weighs. In volume, to be maybe just not in mass because it's you know a bird. Yeah, weight no, right. but like rough, just like sure. Stand them next to each other, size. Right, or like a gazelle or something. Here, you know, gonna, like a I'm little. Going to, I'm going to dangle my keys in front of Jimbo to get him back on topic. Um, Jimbo. <laughs> If a velociraptor, velociraptor were to stumble upon a cidipati nest, what would happen? Um, the velociraptor would be killed and disintegrate, <laughs> probably torn apart. Yes. Um, I, well, I think we, I've heard that art like this might be being produced at some point, but I am very surprised that none of the creative paleo artists online have yet had the inspiration to make an illustration of a mother or father Cidipati on the nest surrounded by decaying <laughs> corpses of velociraptors who've tried to steal their eggs. I like I want them hanging from trees. I, I want it like I want it to be absolutely ghoulish. My dream fossil discovery really 
would be a nest of an oviraptorosaur that is made of the carcasses of dromaeosaurs, like that owl nest that was made out of lemmings. Just like you know, just completely circled. So you've got like dozens of dromaeosaurs in there, and it's just laid its nest in the, or laid it, yeah, laid its eggs in the middle of them. Um, yeah, viewers, you might know, remember the prehistoric planet episode with Kurukula. If that Kurthoraptor had caught it, oh yeah, I, I was worried about my baby. <laughs> there was the reason it was running. Yeah, yeah, it was going fast. Gotta go fast. I was actually, I was like, are they really going to do this? Are they going to introduce it and have it steal an egg and then have it get, like, killed with one Mike Tyson-esque punch? <laughs> Just shredding its skull. Just have it do the Smash Bros. freeze frame as soon as it makes contact and it yeah, flies like the... off the screen. <laughs> and then you just have the explosion jet coming off. Um, oh my God. Yeah, so their their hands would have been big defensive weapons, and they were probably dexterous as well. There seems to have been grasping ability, and at least the basal members. Beaks um, too. I bet that thing could break a bone. What? Oh, the beak. The beaks. Yeah. Yeah. Although the skulls are weird. Their skulls are very lightly built in some respects, and very heavily over engineered in others. It, they're just bizarre animals. The mandible is big and robust. A lot of the bones of the upper jaw are like hair like and delicate. They're it's they're just weird. Jesus Christ, are their palates fucked up? <laughs> oh yeah. Do do we talk briefly about the stalagmite? Let's talk very briefly. We, we've so, mentioned the stalagmite. In my in Does my in my studies. In my studious studies. Ooh, yeah, let's do the skeleton crew thing and zoom into yeah, its Yeah, Alright, perverts, here we go. <laughs> here you go, perverts. Take a look. That was more towards us than to you audience. Oh. <laughs> Never that mind. Was just, that's how we get Alex's attention. Oh, okay. Oh, the issue just, is, that, like, I don't know if they open their mouth wide enough to really check. They do. They do. They do, uh, when they like yell at each other during their social okay, let's... Wait, are its hand, are its wrist pronated, or are they good? I can't uh, tell. No, no, they're 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 kind of doing this. I think that they're, they're kind of halfway. halfway. Like, yeah. like a halfway. Yeah, halfway. Anyway, sorry, I, I don't mean to talk about the wrist. Um, anyway, so yeah, I, I have a few over after sores in my palate studies. Like two, one of these is Caudipteryx, early. One of these is oh, is a Cidipatty, late. Nope. Caudipteryx, yeah. at least looks like a theropod. Ooh, yes. Holy shit! Oh, uh, Cidipatty does not. It's like someone took part of a bird and a turtle and it went, yes, good. And they have one. And dear audience, please note that I'm using quotes tooth in their mouth. This is, as James alluded to earlier, did you call it the stalagmite? Yeah. Well, it's it like, be a stalactite, yeah. right? Because it's coming yeah, down. Right. But yes, the stalactite. It is a horrible r kind of taper tapering rounded protuberance coming off the top of the front of the roof of the mouth that is made up of parts of the vomer and a little bit of the maxilla. It's a horrible thing. And, like, the front of their little, like, their premaxilla are, like, ridged. Yeah, they're, they're like, uh, yeah, they've got those big furrows in them on the yeah. palate. Um, it's a, it's wacky. And, and. Yeah. Scary. And it's in the game. And it's in Is the it? game. Yeah. Yeah, look at that. I'm looking. I don't believe it. I'm shocked. Hats off. Genuinely. Uh, that is an incredible detail. I mean, I, I got it. Like, I got to be honest. This is not the skull of Oviraptor, but this is, with a remarkable degree of fidelity, the skull of MPCD 142. Yeah, th this is a similar case to things that we've had in uh, some of our other videos, where it's just like, it's like, well, this isn't. Really, you a plus Ephelus, It's Anodontosaurus. Well, this isn't really Nodosaurus. It's Borealopelta. Um, this is a, another perfect mm -hmm. example of that. Yeah, and it, and with this, it, it also is another one where I I give it a pass for yeah. not being Overaptor because Overaptor is so incomplete and poorly understood. Like, it's a difficult skull to interpret when you're a specialist. Um, yeah. I can't imagine a paleo artist or like. I sh let me rephrase that. I can't imagine like a character artist for a studio who doesn't have formal training in paleo looking at that and being like, oh yeah, I got it. <laughs> yeah. Like, y you know, it, it's taken a lot of work for scientists to understand it a little. Where, where does the eye go? <laughs> it's, uh, you know... Uh, right in the nostril. 
every once in a while, I come across there's this one. I, I don't think we'll be able to put it up on screen, but um, we'll try to. Uh, there's this one reconstruction of Sidipati that has. Uh, it, it's one of the rare ones that doesn't have a crest on it and all that. It's very uh, have obviously heavily researched off of the actual skulls, um, and it, it just has a lot of feathers on it and stuff. And I and it's like one of those magic eye pictures where I can't for the. F- life of me figure out which direction it's facing because its skull is so fucked up yeah well i I actually very early in my phd when i was nowhere near as knowledgeable about these animals i was looking at the figure of its skull in the paper that mark norell and jim clark published on the cranial anatomy of Sidipati, and i realized after about a minute that i was looking at it backwards like i i thought the back was the front and i it just it took me a while to even know what i was looking at it is it's one of the furthest deviations I've seen the reptile skull taken. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Especially, like, outside of modern groups where we know that there's weird modifications like turtles or birds. I, I'll be, I can't even think of, like, a bird that looks this stupid. Right, I mean, superficially they're very bird-like, although th- these things are on a weird trajectory. Like, um, not to go too into the weeds, but in, in Anjan Buller, who's Alex's PhD advisor's... Um, his 2012 nature paper on pedomorphy or pedomorphosis and the evolution of the dinosaur skull. That was one of the papers from his PhD. Um, like basically he found a pretty simple story of pedomorphosis. Uh, so the retention of juvenile characteristics during growth as a mechanism for driving skull evolution on the line to birds. Mm-hmm. Over after stories are doing something incredibly different, like just on their own axis of development. They're, evolution is incredibly strange um it's worth a lot more study than it's gotten i think oh absolutely Um, one thing i find interesting about them and this gets to alex's point about phylogeny before is there's this lurking hypothesis out there that these animals are actually the closest relatives of birds um that is not currently supported by any of the phylogenetic matrices in use but they share very odd traits with birds that seem to be unlikely to be convergent. I mean, they are convergent under current phylogenetic hypotheses, but I think that the actual amount of support for their current position is quite low. Um, One thing they share with birds is that the quadrate bone develops a double articulation, so one head of the quadrate bone articulates with the brain case, one head articulates with the squamosal bone, that's a very avian trait. It's also found in Ovaraptorosaurus. Is that in Caudipteryx, though, or in Cydipsaurus? That I don't know. I don't actually know if it's known. That would be important to figure out. Yes, yes. And I and I want to emphasize, I don't think they're the sister tax on the birds, but I think the hypothesis that they are has not been, like, completely refuted yet. I, I would not be incredibly surprised if it happens, although I think the current arrangement is correct. Let me put it that way. Mm-hmm. Um, I understand. Yeah. Um, no, looking at them, I mean, like, they have these, like, they do this weird thing with their palatines. It's like a, like a neognath. I, I, you could, if I had never seen one before and was not aware of the rest of if you just showed me a skull, I'd be like, yeah, that's a, uh, that could be a bird. Right. Um, so they're just... I, I, what I find interesting about them, and this is something that I won't ramble on about too long because we've been recording this for two hours, I like fossil groups that show things that are not direct continuations of trends we see in modern animals. I think there's a, a, an overwhelming pull in paleontology to make every fossil a, a like connect the dots in a story from the yeah. ancestor to the modern lineage. And we know in modern animals that there are just incredibly bizarre things that do their own thing, like whales right hmm. whales are so so anatomically odd compared to all other mammals horses horses right um turtles existing at all you know as we've talked about many times a horse um a horse. hominids it, you know we're like we're weird looking mammals i like oviraptorosaurs because they are dinosaurs from what we understand of their ancestry they don't come from any sorts of very unusual animals and they seem to adopt their own evolutionary trajectory that is entirely unique to them. Yeah, it's like Noah's sword. And they're quite diverse, and they're quite successful, and I find that very interesting as this, you know, echo from the fossil record of just what the evolutionary innovation within dinosaur really was. 
right? They're not just all trying to be birds. They're doing a tremendous amount of their own experimentation. And I think seeing those things makes our understanding of the fossil record a lot richer. Well, okay. I have a quick question. Um, sure. In the spirit of variation and weird adaptations and all of the talk about their weird skulls and stalactite palettes and all that awful stuff, this game depicts it as an omnivore. What on earth were these bastards eating? Anything they wanted. I don't know. I think, you know what, funny enough, I think they, I think they would make a meal out of some eggs. Oh, I thought they, they would, them. yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, almost everything does. I, I've heard a hypothesis, and I don't think it's really borne out. I think a lot of current ideas are that they were mostly herbivorous. Um, but I heard a hypothesis that the stalactite was actually used to crack shellfish. Yeah, well, like, a, like a lobster I've cracker. That That's, um, and I kind of love it's that. It's borne out in one of my favorite Overaptorosaur paleo art pieces. I linked it in the chat earlier. It's by um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Wayne Barlow, Wayne Barlow. who is... A, one of my favorite God artists, goes. and the guy. hasn't done a tremendous amount of paleo art, but has, everything he's done at paleo art is, like, outstandingly good, and his overaptor is extremely cool, and it's holding a crab. My only issue with that is... Are shellfish known to be particularly abundant yeah. where they're found? No, they're not. Okay. Right, no, they're, they're mostly found in arid environments that are probably not going to be hosting a lot of clams and mussels and crabs. Um... But I love the idea. I, I suspect they were mostly herbivorous, but they were probably very opportunistic omnivores. Which, hell, could be part of why when they appear on the scene in the late Cretaceous, they're really diverse. Like, all of these Gobi localities have a pretty diverse assemblage of oviraptorosaurs. It's rare for a locality to have only one. Um, and some of them, there's as many as five or six. I do, I do really like the depiction of it in uh, Dinosaur Planet, um, in mm. the Velociraptor episode, which, if you know your your deep Scott lore, uh, scared me half to f <laughs> death as a child. Those Overaptors literally, genuinely haunted my dreams for years. Especially, there's one scene where like the Velociraptors are trying to chase down like a Shibuya or something like that and then like just Shibuya is like looking back at the Velociraptors and then gets like clotheslined by a Cidipotty and slammed on the ground while it's screaming and it's making the most awful like demon turkey noises and god awful now, we'll play but, it here oh yes <laughs> I'm and, curious Jimbo about your, your opinion on the following matter sure in a given environment do you think that Gigantoraptor would be a monstrous thing that kills things? Or is it mostly chill plant guy? Or both? I think it would have behaved like a large herbivore in that it was probably the most dangerous thing in its ecosystem by far. Yeah. Um, Oviraptorosaurs don't have particularly advanced brains. Um, they're, they're large for a dinosaur. Hurts the bird thing. It does. I mean, I, I want to be very clear. I don't think they're the sister group to birds. No, no, I no think I'm just thinking about it. Right, right. right. I, okay. I think it's. I think it's not. It's not worth discarding from our minds how similar they are because the similarities might involve some shared developmental mechanisms or some pathway that they're both finding. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, their brains are not very advanced. I don't think they were amazingly smart animals. Um, and larger herbivores are always the most dangerous thing to be around. It's like, did you see, have you guys seen the clip that's been going around Twitter recently of a grizzly bear yeah. being chased <laughs> around by, oh, yeah. a, by a cow moose? It's great. And it is running so it's fast. Insane. It's running so fast. And the cow moose is almost hitting it with its front hooves and stuff. It's so funny. Yeah. yeah. That bear no, I mean, is skedaddling. Listen, I, I've gone on record, and I'll say it again. If you had to plot me into the Hell Creek ecosystem, the dinosaur I'd be most afraid of coming across in the wild would be an adult triceratops. Well, it's oh, yeah. one of those things that, like, with uh, the reason why herbivores are so are so comparatively dangerous is because if you threaten the health and safety of a predator, it's probably just going to determine, like, hey, I'm going to back off. I need to make sure that I'm in good physical condition so I can hunt and kill something for my food. If you threaten the physical safety or startle an herbivore, it's like, 
I am going to die. It is it, it, two men enter, one man leaves. Uh, like <laughs> they, yeah. they do the f- Henry Cavill thing where they like reload yeah. biceps and start punching. Every Triceratops reloads its horns. <laughs> I don't need to be able to. I don't need to be able to be that healthy to eat vegetables. Yeah, and you're about to be. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, S- speaking right. of and, uh, animals and like, getting oh go on go on well go i mean on. it's just triceratops is these tiny little eyes it's got this tiny little brain it can't see it can't think it's just it's just fear <laughs> react 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 it's fear and it and it has a, a f- phalanx yeah. for a face right it, it's is there a living thing in front of me not anymore yes, no is it a triceratops <laughs> if no stab yeah. if yes also stab <laughs> and then maybe make a baby um, Right. <laughs> Speaking of things got I, I would wager, obliterated. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, just very quickly. I would wager that the AI coded Triceratops that they had for. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, just for, kill uh, everything. Morian is probably smarter than the real Correct. animal. <laughs> it, it's probably yeah. also accurate. <laughs> right, um, yeah. Kill everything around me. It, it's, it really is an evolution of, or I guess the, the evolutionary ancestor of that whole like meme about house repairs with duct tape and WD-40 with the dichotomous tree. <laughs> right. now, does, it, but, does it move? Yes. Should it move? No. Duct tape. Right. Now, Scott, tell the, is that yes. the story you wanted to tell? Uh, no, because... the story I was going to tell, or Sorry. the thing I was trying to set up, was speaking of things getting absolutely eviscerated, Let's introduce this thing to a Velociraptor and just see what happens. Let's yeah. do it. This is called a counterfactual <laughs> because it's it's not what would have happened. No, no, well, no it might not, have been what happens to like an Overraptor. They're not an Overraptor large, like an Achillobatar, right? If Achillobatar is what, what what it is said it is, sure. Well, Achillobatar yeah. is a Dromaeosaur, I think. I think it's a Dromaeosaur. It's a weird one though. It is very weird. Make sure we have combat turned on. I think we do. But I'll double check. If there if there's an over raptor, over raptor sore on the map, combat is always turned on. <laughs> right. Over raptor like, sores lived in a PvP environment. It, I mean, just thinking about animals that are like underappreciated in media, over raptor sores would be a horrifying thing yeah. to have in a dinosaur, like in a dinosaur movie or game. They've had them in a recent dinosaur. Well, they, they did. did. They, they did. Film sixty five. Hit film. Everybody loved it. It, it broke new ground. You see it, you, it broke new. You can barely see it, of course, but it's there. Fighting Adam Driver. Right. It's unrealistic because in real life it would have killed him. Well, it puts up more of a fight than the Tyrannosaur. Adam Driver blows like the front half of one of their faces off in two seconds, and he almost and it just ragdolls by a naked monster over after. Oh, here we go. There it is. Let's see. <gasps> oh God. Oh. 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 It's so pathetic. Oh, I'm sad now. I'm sad. Why did we do let's, this? <laughs> let's read it. Let's rate it. <laughs> Whoa. I bugged it. I I somehow got like a melanistic one. What? I don't know what, what I did. That's so cool. We need to keep it. Whoa. That kicks Can you ass. Give it a pattern? Um, let's see. It thinks it's on Amazon Rainforest. Or will that break it? No, yeah, you bugged oh, that. No! Yeah, uh, well, that's still pretty good yeah. looking. It's hard to mess these guys up. They're really cool, but we have the footage of the all black. Uh, that was a cool bug. Um, Amelia has been contacted from the oh, ether. the other side. <laughs> Ouija board. What did she say, Dalton? She said S, yeah. S. Oh my god, okay. Strong start. So, strong start. Um, you go, you're next. I'm going to keep it brief. A tier, because while I find it absolutely beautiful, I think the, the lack of the giant <laughs> off hands 
just feels like a huge glaring omission to me. I love it. I love it. I, I would say it's very, very high A. But for S, I, I can't deal with putting an S tier if I feel like there's a big part of the animal that's missing. Totally fair. Mm-hmm. I would agree with that. I would still say that this is my favorite design of a feathered dinosaur before the feathered species pack. And because of that, and because it is such a glaring omission of dinosaurs in uh, the Jurassic franchise and in the game, personally, it's an S. I, I think its behaviors are fantastic. I think that its colorations are stunning and... It's, it, it makes good sounds, too. I like its little, like, birdie chirps and everything. And they got the damn stalactite. I forgot about the stalactite. So did I. I hope we're just not, like, interpreting, like, the internal texture of the mouth, stupid. No, it but... was definitely there. All right. Well, then in that case, I was thinking a high A because, like Jimbo... It's very pretty. I love the skins. I love the feathers on the tail. I love the little mohawk. I like the crest, even though, you know, it's, you know, whatever. But, but the short arms do kind of throw me. I'm looking now. I realize it's got kind of longish feathers on the back of its arms, but it could be better. But it really is the only one in the game. And for the only one in the game, it's solid. I would say, Dalton, do you have a strong feeling on what this I know is? what I'm going to make it. Yes. Okay. In that case, I would say this is a low S for me. Yeah, for me as well. This is an S. I, I okay, echo but... everything, what everyone said. It's cute. I think it's one of the prettiest designs in the game. I really, I just like to look at it. It looks like, I mean, yeah, its arms are wrong, but like this looks like an animal to me. Um, even if it's not a correct kind of animal, like it looks real. And, and of course, S for stalagmite or stalactite, excuse me. Uh, I would I would also go so far as to say I, I just had the thought pop into my head of this is such a beautiful design I forget it's from the movie, which is yeah. simultaneously praise <laughs> it, it's it's damning with praise it's a backhanded compliment, um, but yeah yeah I forget no I mean this is from the movie I, I don't hate the fact that it's going to be S tier, um, I I think familiarity breeds contempt. Not in that I don't like over yeah, sores, but I'm too exactly. familiar with these animals, so I have contempt for mm-hmm. the design. Mm-hmm. Um, no, I mean, it, it's it's true. It's And I think the stalactite, had I been thinking about that, might have put it up to S tier for me as well. Not that it matters. But I do just wish that yeah. the hands and arms were done a little bit better. Like if it had pyroraptor-type feathering on the hands, I think at that point I'd even forgive the tiny arms. But yeah. in any case... So we have all voted, and we now officially rank Oviraptor as the newest addition to S tier. Hooray! There we go. S and A are now equal. We're pretty easy. If you put feathers on things, we'll like it. Okay. Now all right, is it time well. to spin the wheel? Uh, our, yes. Spin our, hey look, new and improved wheel. Our new branded wheel. Wow, it looks wow. very good. Thank you, Scott. Yeah. You're welcome. I All right, now let's spin this bitch. All right, everybody. It's time to spin, spin, spin that, 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 that wheel. Seal. Wheel. Damn, those echoes are wild, bro. You can just, if you just mute the stream, it helps. Oh. Yes. Yes. No. Oh, what a disappointment. Oh, my. Sorry, Sora. No, it's all right, I guess. All right, I guess. I really like Sora Pelta, but damn, it could have been cats. <laughs> hey, well, come back next time for not the worst Ankylosaur in the game and not the best one. It's a pretty, right. it's a pretty good one, but if I'm tipping my hand. I forget what it looks like. It ain't like. no Min Mai. Oh, it ain't no, it ain't no Min Mai. And it's not the Ankylosaurus either, which is... Anyway. Anyway, yes. Um... Now, 
I must make a repeated plea. I want to briefly remind you that if you enjoy our videos, you should show us that by liking and commenting on our videos and by subscribing to our channel if you haven't already. And if you really like the stuff we make and want to support us even more, and you're able to, we'd appreciate it if you consider supporting us on Patreon. If you support us on Patreon, you'll be uh, given a code to join our exclusive Discord server, which is only for patrons of the Skeleton Crew. It's a wonderful server. It's becoming a really, really, really nice and supportive community that I'm very proud of, and I can't wait to see it grow a little bit more. Um, if you're a patron, you'll also get patron-exclusive merch. You'll get the ability to post questions for our monthly Q&A videos. And if you're a patron at a very high tier, Gorgosaurus and above, you will have your name spoken at the end of each one of our videos in a special shout-out. And those patrons, as of this recording, are Benjamin Seepser, Philip Fico, Andrew Niddle, Florida Man, Max Ironpaw, Riley Shero, and Wheat. The Thanks. rest of our patrons, uh, along with those, will all be featured in the scrolling credits at the end of the video, which uh, our editor for this week will put up right now. So support us on Patreon if you can. It means a lot to us, and it really helps us justify taking the time that we need to to make these videos as good as they can be. And every bit of support we get there really helps us out in that regard. So consider it if you can. All right, guys. We'll yeah, see you right. next week. Thanks right. so much, bye everybody. Bye. And thank bye. you. Bye.